an emperor who wanted to have his favorite horse appointed to the highest office in the government. An emperor who spent hours a day alone in a room catching flies and impaling them on pins. And an emperor who bankrupted the state, building a grandiose palace for himself, featuring 50 different lavish dining rooms and a 120-foot-high golden naked statue of himself outside its front door. All of these stories are true, and all took place in the first decades of the empire. How on earth did the Roman Empire end up with so many horrible and incompetent men as its leaders? To find the answer, we have to look to Rome's very first emperor, Augustus, and the precedent he established for how emperors were selected. Augustus had brilliantly succeeded in figuring out how to rule Rome as one man without overtly seeming like a king. Augustus's reign was marked by many other spectacular achievements. He brought peace and stability to the Roman world after an era of chaos and civil war. He patronized art and artists, such as Virgil and Ovid. He secured the borders and reformed the army. He reorganized Roman society and passed numerous laws intended to restore morality. And he extensively rebuilt the city of Rome. In his own words, inheriting a city of brick, but leaving one built of marble. He became the inspiration and model for subsequent leaders. However, there was one major flaw in his settlement of the empire, the issue of succession. Since there was no official position of emperor, there was nothing concrete to transfer to the next person. Even above the question of how to pass on the empire, there was the more vexing problem of how to select the best qualified. What do you think should have been the solution? What would have been the ideal method for choosing who would become the next emperor? For better or worse, and many times during the next century it would be for the worse, Augustus settled on the principle of heredity. The next emperor would be the nearest male blood relative of the previous one. Augustus's choice of heredity as the mechanism for succession was somewhat curious in that he actually had no close male relatives. He had no sons from any of his three marriages, nor did he have any brothers. What he had to work with were three women, his sister, Octavia, his daughter, Julia, and his third wife, Livia. Augustus looked first to his sister, Octavia. She had a very promising teenage son named Marcellus. In order to solidify Marcellus as his heir, Augustus forced his 14-year-old daughter, Julia, to marry Marcellus in 25 BC. Augustus then began grooming Marcellus to take over, appointing him, despite his youth, to a number of government posts so that he would gain experience and respect as a leader. Marcellus was bright and popular, and things were looking good. But two years later, Augustus' plans ran into some bad luck when Marcellus caught an illness and unexpectedly died when he was just 19 years old. Augustus next focused his attention on his loyal friend and general, Agrippa, who had played such a key role in Augustus' rise to power, and who had effectively been serving as his second-in-command. Poor 18-year-old Julia was compelled to marry 43-year-old Agrippa. This made Agrippa Augustus's heir, and even though the two men were actually the same age, everyone assumed that Agrippa would outlive Augustus because Augustus had always been sickly, whereas Agrippa had a robust constitution. Agrippa was highly competent, extremely experienced, and widely respected. So once again, everything seemed fine. Until Augustus' plans ran into some bad luck when Agrippa unexpectedly died in 12 BC. All was not lost, however, because the union of Agrippa and Julia had produced two sons, Gaius and Lucius. Augustus was very fond of these grandsons and pushed the Senate to grant them extraordinary honors. 
The boys were featured on coins, touted as the young principes, and given important military and political posts, even as teenagers. Gaius was appointed to the consulship, the highest office in the government, at the tender age of 20. To make the succession even clearer, Augustus adopted Gaius and Lucius as his own sons. Despite their privileged upbringing, both boys seemed stable and promising, and everything was looking good. But then Augustus's plans ran into some bad luck. In 2 AD, while en route to Spain to gain additional military experience, Lucius fell ill and died at the age of 19. There was still his brother, Gaius, who had already served in numerous military and government posts. However, just 18 months later, there was more bad luck when Gaius was slightly wounded in a skirmish in Armenia. Though not serious, the injury apparently did not heal properly. Gaius fell ill, and shortly thereafter, he died in 4 AD at the age of just 23 years old. Poor Augustus then had to start from scratch and somehow come up with another heir. By now, it was an issue of some urgency, since Augustus himself was 66 years old and had never been particularly healthy. All of his attempts to find an heir so far had focused on his family, the Julian family. But now, he had simply run out of close male Julians. The only remaining male even remotely connected to Augustus was the son of his wife, Livia, by a previous marriage. This stepson of Augustus's was a man named Tiberius Claudius Nero. After the death of Agrippa, Augustus had forced Tiberius to divorce a wife that he loved in order to marry the widowed Julia. The hapless Julia was also less than thrilled with this arrangement. Augustus had never liked Tiberius very much, but Augustus now had little choice but to adopt Tiberius as his son and promote him as heir to the throne. Understandably resentful of repeatedly being used as a dynastic pawn, Julia sought happiness by having a number of affairs. This enraged the image-sensitive Augustus, since her behavior undermined his desire to present his own family as a model of propriety. He responded by banishing his daughter to a tiny island less than a mile square. As for Tiberius, by marrying Julia, he became at the same time Augustus's son by adoption, his stepson by marriage, and his son-in-law by marriage. It was also a union between step-siblings. By this convoluted path, Augustus ultimately ended up promoting a member of the Claudian family, rather than the Julian one, as his heir. Throughout all of this, Augustus had steadfastly persisted in basing the succession on the principle of heredity, and thus set the precedent for how future emperors would be chosen. They would be the nearest male blood relative, another characteristic of a monarchy. Augustus surprised everybody by living a very long time. He finally keeled over in 14 AD of natural causes at the ripe old age of 77. Supposedly among his final words was a popular parting line used by actors in the theater. If I have played my role well, then kindly clap your hands and dismiss me from the stage with applause. Given his facility at manipulating symbols and his adept use of propaganda, perhaps the choice of this line, likening himself to an actor, reveals something about the way he viewed his political career. At the time of Augustus' demise, Tiberius was already 54 years old. The moment of Augustus' death was perhaps the best opportunity to restore the Roman Republic. If the Senate were ever going to reassert itself, it would have to be now. However, Augustus had ruled so long that by 14 AD, there was literally no one left alive who could remember the old Republic. The sheer length of Augustus' reign 
is one of the main reasons why the system that he set up took hold so strongly and became the model for the future. Tiberius had a grim, serious personality. He was coldly intellectual, socially awkward, and introverted. Right after Augustus' death, he dithered and vacillated about what to do, and he seemed reluctant to take on Augustus' role. In this time of confusion, hoping to avoid more civil war, the Senate looked to Tiberius to assert himself. The first time that Tiberius appeared in the Senate after Augustus' death culminated in an almost comic moment. When Tiberius reluctantly agreed to play a part in government, a senator asked him, well, what part of the empire would you like? In the end, Tiberius did take over, and the Senate voted to grant him all the same titles and powers that Augustus had possessed. Though soldiers were compelled to swear an oath of loyalty to the new emperor, various resentments had been building in the army. This resulted in the first crisis of his reign, when a number of the legions along the northern Germanic border mutinied. With his dour personality, Tiberius was ill-suited to win over the troops. But he did have a relative who was gregarious and popular. This was his brother's son, Germanicus. And so Tiberius sent the charismatic Germanicus to soothe the legions, a task he accomplished so well that not only did he calm the revolt, but he also invaded Germany and managed to recapture some of the legionary standards that had been lost in the disaster at the Teutoburg Forest, when Varus had allowed his army to be lured into a trap and wiped out. Considering his relatively advanced age, Tiberius had to quickly pick a successor, and Germanicus would have made a logical, popular, and reasonably skilled heir. Fresh off his success in Germany, the dashing young Germanicus was dispatched to another troubled frontier, the eastern border in Armenia. To match his military achievements, he now displayed some administrative skills, organizing the provinces there. He probably would have made a good future emperor, but unfortunately, Germanicus promptly fell ill and died in 19 AD. Tiberius did have a son named Drusus, however, and although he was not as popular as Germanicus had been, Drusus was an experienced leader, and now became the heir apparent, so the situation at least seemed stable. Meanwhile, back at Rome, it had always been technically forbidden to have troops in Italy, but under the emperors, a new group called the Praetorian Guard was established. This was a contingent of elite soldiers stationed in the city of Rome who were supposed to serve as the emperor's bodyguard. In reality, they far more often ended up assassinating an emperor rather than protecting him. Already under Tiberius, the prefect or commander of the Praetorian Guard, a man named Sejanus, began to exceed his jurisdiction and assume control over much of the government. Sejanus was plainly very ambitious, and he was maneuvering to become not merely Tiberius's right-hand man, an aim which he largely achieved, but to position himself as a potential heir to the emperor. This goal was advanced when Germanicus unexpectedly died, and then truly became attainable when just a few years later in 23 AD, Drusus suddenly fell ill and died when he was only 36 years old. The conniving Sejanus began an affair with Drusus's widow and sought permission from Tiberius to marry her, a move which would have made him a blood relative to Tiberius and thus a legitimate candidate for the throne. Tiberius denied this request, but continued to allow Sejanus to exercise considerable power, so that Sejanus often effectively ruled on his behalf. 
Tiberius never did seem to enjoy being emperor, and appeared glad to leave a lot of the day-to-day -day details of administration in his delegates' hands. In 26 AD, Tiberius left Rome for good, and retreated to his pleasure villa, uh, located on the island of Capri, on a spectacular promontory overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. By the way, if you visit Capri today, there's a trail that you can hike along and eventually reach the ruins of Tiberius's villa. There, you can stroll along the same colonnaded paths that Tiberius and other famous Romans did. I've always found it both a particularly beautiful and evocative spot. With Tiberius in semi-retirement on Capri, Sejanus was left in charge at Rome, and he began to abuse his power. Tiberius was not a popular emperor. He was tight-fisted, and in contrast to the extensive building projects of Augustus and Agrippa, many of which were constructed for the enjoyment of the populace of Rome, Tiberius built almost nothing. Nor did he sponsor lavish public spectacles for the common people. And even when obligatory entertainments were given, he refused to attend. And this was an action that the people expected of their emperors. In his relationships with the Senate and other aristocrats, Tiberius was suspicious and unfriendly. Thus, he was unpopular with both the lower and upper classes of Roman society. Although his policies did not earn him the favor of the people, the empire was nonetheless run fairly efficiently under his rule. And his miserliness had the positive result that by the time Tiberius died, the treasury had a surplus of several billion sesterces. Although Sejanus was working hard to set himself up to succeed Tiberius, Germanicus's widow, Agrippina, was actively campaigning to promote her son by the popular deceased general as Tiberius's heir. This was a boy officially named Gaius Julius Caesar Germanicus, but he was widely known by the nickname Caligula. He had acquired this name uh, when he was just a toddler in his father's army camp in Germany, when the soldiers had given him a miniature pair of army boots. The boots worn by Roman soldiers were called Caligae, and so the nickname Caligula can be roughly translated as little boots or bootykins. The rivalry between Sejanus and Agrippina continued to escalate eventually reaching a crisis point when Sejanus became impatient and openly plotted to harm Agrippina and Caligula. Tiberius could not tolerate such a direct threat against members of his family, with the result that Sejanus was abruptly denounced and executed. He was replaced as prefect of the Praetorian Guard by a man named Macro. During the last years of his life, Tiberius stayed in seclusion on Capri. He had always been a superstitious man, and during this time, he was particularly influenced by his personal astrologer, Thrasyllus. According to at least some sources, Tiberius also indulged in various sexual perversions. The candidates to succeed him were Caligula and a son of Drusus's named Gemellus. Both were still young, and they were appointed as co-heirs. In 37 AD, Tiberius finally died at the age of 77. Of the two rival heirs, Caligula 
appears to have been the more ambitious. And he had secured the backing of Macro, the new commander of the Praetorian Guard. With Macro's help, Caligula pushed aside the younger Gemellus and took power. At the time of his accession, Caligula was 25 years old, and at first he was greeted with enormous enthusiasm. His father, Germanicus, had been very popular, and this affection carried over to Caligula. Although he had been granted many titles, however, Caligula actually had very little practical experience of governing. Most of his youth had been spent either in the palace or with Tiberius on Capri, where he had grown up in a unhealthy atmosphere of constant plotting and paranoia. Nevertheless, he charmed the Senate, people, and army with his initial behavior. Caligula distributed huge amounts of cash as gifts to the people of Rome and also to the soldiers. He staged extravagant beast hunts, chariot races, spectacles, and entertainments for the amusement of the inhabitants of the city. The Senate and upper-class Romans were pleased by his cutting of taxes on the sale of slaves and by his demeanor towards them, which was respectful and conciliatory. Late in 37 AD, Caligula fell ill with some sort of brain fever, and afterwards his behavior changed. Whether this was an effect of the illness, as some sources claim, or whether once he felt securely in charge, his true nature began to assert itself doesn't really matter. He became increasingly erratic and cruel. He had Macro executed and forced Gemellus to commit suicide. He terrorized and humiliated members of the Senate, for instance, making them run awkwardly alongside his chariot in their togas, and he even raped one eminent senator's wife. There were many rumors of Caligula's depravity, including that he supposedly committed incest with all three of his sisters. He had Roman citizens murdered for flimsy excuses, and disturbingly, he took pleasure from watching his victims being tortured, even goading on the executioners with cries of, make him feel that he is dying. He liked to whisper into his lover's ears, I can have your beautiful throat cut any time I like. One time, when presiding over the sacrifice of a bull, instead of bringing down the hammer on the animal's cranium, Caligula instead deliberately bludgeoned to death the priest's assistant who was holding the bull's head. Some of his cruelties, while not overtly deadly, had a capricious, arbitrary nature. He would order that the awnings providing shade for the crowds at public entertainments be pulled back at the hottest time of the day. Or if he ran across a man with a thick head of hair, he would have him seized and his scalp roughly shaved on the spot. This was because Caligula himself was balding. The list of his alleged crimes is long, but I think you get the idea. Perhaps Caligula's attitude can best be summed up by another of his famous sayings. Let everyone hate me so long as they fear me. Most of this behavior was inflicted upon the inhabitants of Rome, but some of his actions had farther reaching effects. To pay for his extravagance, he ended up raising some taxes, imposing new ones, and confiscating the property of citizens that he had murdered. Under Augustus, the Jews had been granted certain rights and had been allowed to follow their traditional practices. But Caligula deeply offended them by ordering that his own statue be placed in the great temple in Jerusalem, as if he were a god, and he turned a blind eye to pogroms against them. 
In an apparent desire to gain military glory, he organized a massive army and led it into Gaul and Germany, but accomplished nothing there. Then, with great fanfare, he announced that he would invade the island of Britain. But the troops never actually launched the attack. Instead, Caligula lined them up in battle formation on the beach facing the English Channel, ordered them to collect seashells, and then declared that these were the spoils of a great victory and would be displayed in his triumph. Another eccentric action involving the ocean occurred on the Bay of Naples, where Caligula ordered that a three-mile-long temporary bridge be constructed across the width of the bay from Puteoli to Baiae. It was made by lining up a double row of merchant ships, and an elaborate roadway was then laid down on top of them. So many grain freighters were diverted to indulge this whim that it resulted in a famine at Rome. Caligula spent several days triumphantly riding back and forth over this bridge and parading the Roman army across it. He distributed bonuses to the soldiers and held sumptuous feasts and elaborate celebrations in honor of his pointless and wasteful accomplishment. In a short time, such extravagances squandered the enormous treasury surplus that had been built up by Tiberius and plunged the empire into debt. Many rulers throughout history have displayed a tendency towards cruelty and self-aggrandizing behavior. Scholars still debate whether Caligula was merely a particularly extreme example of this phenomenon, or if he was actually ment mentally unbalanced in a clinical sense. Some ancient authors are more direct. The biographer Suetonius bluntly asserted, Caligula was sick in both body and mind. One controversial aspect of Caligula's behavior, often raised as evidence of his insanity, was his apparent desire to be worshipped as a god. Now, there is some ambiguity in the surviving sources regarding this issue. It had already become customary for Romans to offer prayers to an emperor's genius, uh, which might be thought of as a person's capacity or potential for divinity. But worship of the genius is not the same as regarding that person as a god. Leaders could also be elevated to divine status after their deaths. Augustus had done this for Julius Caesar and had erected a prominent temple in the Forum in Rome to the deified Julius. After his death, Augustus too had been declared a god. In the eastern sections of the empire, there was a long tradition of ruler cults, and kings were often given religiously tinged titles such as Soter or Savior. When these areas were conquered by Rome, these ruler cult observances were seamlessly transferred to the emperors. But in the west and at Rome, there was still reluctance to view living emperors as divine. With regard to Caligula, some sources claim that he openly expressed the desire to be worshipped as a god, and may even have truly believed that he was some sort of divinity. He allegedly dressed up as various gods, spoke to them as equals, and had temples to himself built. Whether these actions occurred or not, at the very least, when individuals who wished to ingratiate themselves with Caligula instituted cults to him, or addressed him with divine titles, he does not seem to have discouraged it. Additional evidence of his megalomania is that Caligula routinely appeared dressed in a special all-purple toga decorated with golden palm leaves and clutching an ivory scepter surmounted with a golden eagle. And this is an outfit which traditionally had been reserved for generals on the day that they celebrate a triumph. The king of the gods, Jupiter, was often envisioned in this same garb, further suggesting that Caligula saw himself as a divinity. One of the most notorious stories 
often linked to Caligula's insanity, concerns his enthusiasm for chariot racing. He was an avid fan of the sport, and especially of his favorite team, the Greens. Caligula was particularly enamored of one horse, Incitatus, whose name might be translated as Speedy. At Caligula's orders, a special stable of marble and ivory was built for Incitatus, and the horse enjoyed purple blankets, wore a collar studded with precious gems, and had a large staff of attendants. On the day before races, military units were posted around the neighborhood to ensure that no one made any noise so that Speedy might get a good night's sleep. Allegedly, Caligula planned to have his beloved Incitatus appointed to the post of consul, the highest government office. After less than four years of this sort of behavior, many were fed up with Caligula, and a conspiracy formed to assassinate him. Among its leaders were a number of officers of the Praetorian Guard, including a tribune named Cassius Chirea, whom Caligula had taken a particular delight in humiliating. On January 24, 41 AD, Caligula went to the theater to take part in festivities associated with the Palatine Games. He sacrificed a flamingo, watched some performances, and then, around 1 o'clock, headed back to the palace for lunch. Kyria and some other officers intercepted Caligula and fell upon him with their swords, stabbing him 30 times. Now that Rome had rid itself of one bad and possibly crazy emperor, the question was, who would take his place? The next pair of emperors, whom we will meet in the next lecture, would include one of the more unlikely people to become ruler of the Roman world, and a man who is arguably even more demented than Caligula. <laughs>